To commemorate the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, we're interviewing a group of scribal residents who were participants in that particular war. Today's uh, subject is Frank Church. Frank? Well, to begin with, I should tell you where I came from. Uh, I was born in Syracuse in 1921. Uh, and uh, at the age of 10, uh, we came to Scriba, uh, where my father was born and brought up. And uh, I went to, uh, went to grade school here, at part of grade school at District Number 10, and then went to Oswego High School and graduated from there. And in 19, uh, to get right to the, to the war period, and, uh, I enlisted in the Army Air Corps, as it was known then, in, in, on July 4th, 19. Uh, 42, and, but I was not called up to active service until January of 1943, at which time I proceeded to uh, the Army Air Corps base at Keesler Field, Mississippi for basic training. And uh, after graduating from basic training, I remained at Keesler Field because they had a B-24 mechanic school there, at which I attended, graduated from. And following that, I went to uh, uh, Arlington, Texas, to Aerial Gunnery School. After graduating from gunnery school, I proceeded to Westover Air Force Base at, uh, West, at, uh, in Massachusetts, where our crews were formed. Uh, there were uh, pilots and co-pilots and navigators and bombardiers and and gunners for all positions. I was a, my, my job would be flight engineer and top turret gunner, and we had a radio operator. We all formed there, uh, hundreds of us, as a matter of fact. I remember the day that our crew was formed, we went to the theater, and each of us was given a card with a number on it. And there were nine other people besides me with that same number. When they called that number off, we went and sat down, and that's how the crew was formed. We never saw each other before. Right. And, uh, and from, from Westover, we proceeded to, as a crew, to Charleston uh, Air Base, where we trained as a crew. And we did uh, uh, over water flying to Cuba, night flying, and so on, we did all the training as a crew we could together. And after we finished that, we went to uh, New York City and boarded the Queen Elizabeth and headed for the United Kingdom. Uh, we landed in Scotland on D-Day, so we right. didn't participate in the invasion. We got there the day the invasion started. Okay. And uh, after, right from there, we went to North Ireland where we were uh, given orientation lectures and told how to behave ourselves in England when we got there, which was where we <laughs> And, uh, and various things about the people and customs. And we left there and proceeded to the first air base we were at. We were only there a very short time, uh, and we moved, in fact, two or three times before we came to our regular permanent base. And we formed the nucleus of what I found out re just recently, in fact, this year, uh, a brand new type of aerial warfare. They didn't have a name for it when I was in, we were actually doing, but it turns out that the squadron I belong to is still in existence, and it's still active. It doesn't have airplanes, but it, it's, a, it's a paper research development type of squadron. In fact, I met the people just this summer who ran it, who run it. Uh, but what we formed was uh, the 39th Heavy Bombardment Squadron, and we were in uh, B-24s, by the way, Okay. And uh, because we weren't going to be dropping bombs, we dropped our bombardier from our crew and flew with nine members of our crew instead of ten. <coughs> uh, the, the 39th uh, was based most of the time that we were flying with it in a place called Cheddington in England, which is in uh, New, uh, Bedfordshire, near the city of Luton. And uh, we flew uh, eventually 55 combat missions, uh, and uh, these, these were flown uh, in concert with, with missions uh, of, of the 8th Air Force bombing missions. And what we did was go out in our, our bomb bays, instead of carrying bombs, were loaded with uh, uh, communications equipment and, and uh, 
anti-radar equipment. Our, our purpose was to disrupt communications and radar, German radar, so they couldn't pick up our bomber streams on their radar screens. We could go out and set up a diversion, and they would think that there was a, a mission going somewhere else. They would okay. send up their airplanes, chasing them all over Eastern or Western Europe, and, uh, and they couldn't find us or the bomber stream, which yeah. was somewhere else. This was. And we were, this was good only up to a certain point, and then the bomber streams flew out of the range of our protection. Okay. And, uh, and, but we also were there when they came back. Uh, uh, and we flew mostly uh, in the area of the Channel and the North Sea and uh, Normandy, uh, northern France, and the Rhineland. Uh, and, and we were in that area. Uh, <coughs> It's interesting that this type of warfare is still uh, part of the Air Force. It's called electronic warfare now, okay. and, and which was it was not called that then. And I just heard that term for the first time this year. Uh, we had a reunion of our squadron down in uh, North Carolina, the only one we've ever had. But after uh, uh, our, our crew became a family type of situation. Uh, when I went to this reunion, the only people I knew at that reunion, except by names that I remember, were my own crew. I've seen them since uh, several times. But to get down to that, that reunion and meet all of these people whose names were, I had in my mind, I could remember the minute they mentioned their name, I, met, I knew the name, but I couldn't, of course, I didn't recognize them. They were all old, okay. like I am. Do you have any specific questions you'd sure. like to ask? Sure. Um, well, I was wondering, are there, were there any other uh, scribe or residents in your company? Or? No, yes. no. I only met one person all the time I was in the service from Scriber, and that was Kurt Schell. He came down to uh, Keesler Field. He transferred from the infantry to the Air Corps, okay. and he was there just a short time. And then when, when the uh, German counteroffensive came along in '44. Uh, they took all the trained infantry men who were in the Air Corps and put them back in the infantry, and that's how we happened to go back into the infantry. Okay. Uh, because he was uh, he was a staff sergeant at, at the time, and so uh, he had a lot of training, and uh, they needed him. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, um, what were the reactions of people uh, uh, in England towards American soldiers there? Pretty much, I found that they were very, they were very uh, hospitable. They they were happy to have us there, mm -hmm. uh, and for obvious reasons. Because the other, we had the war probably would have gone another way. Uh, not that they didn't do an awful lot to win that war themselves, but they had, uh, well, they needed help. And uh, in spite of the fact that, if, for instance. The Thomas Scriba were inundated by a bunch of foreigners outnumbering us in many places. Uh, it was amazing to me that they kept their good their goodwill as long as they did because it was kind of overwhelming for them. They, they, everything <coughs> changed. Uh -huh. Life uh, totally changed uh -huh. because there were so many of us. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, but as a, uh, by and large, we were welcomed and we were treated well, and mm -hmm. in return, we treated them well too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was a, for at least my experience was a good one. Okay. Okay. Where were you on VE day, Jeff? Right. I was through with my missions. I was back home. I was, but I was still in the Air Corps. I was in, down at um, San Antonio, Texas, about to commence training as a B-29 flight engineer to go to Japan. Oh my. So, and that's when uh, VE day happened. Okay. Yeah. VJ Day, of course, was later in the year, and uh, I, they, at that time, just that summer, they had come up with a point system for discharging people. If you had enough points, you could get out, and I had enough, so I eventually got out and came home on September 5th of 45. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, what point during the war was morale among your unit the highest? The highest? Well, our morale generally was pretty, pretty good. We had we had lots of time to ourselves. When we weren't needed to fly a mission, 
we could go anywhere and do anything we wanted to do. We, didn't, mm -hmm. we were not restricted to, to, to the post or anything like that. And uh, in fact, our, our squad was probably a lot different than many of the others, uh, but we did have uh, a lot of free time. Uh, the only time they wanted us, we had to be there if we had a mission, and they were posted the day before. Mm -hmm. So we knew when we had to be there, and we made sure we stayed home that night. We didn't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, but I think the, the point where most people were, were uh, concerned about what was going to happen was the big German offensive, counteroffensive in mm -hmm. late 1944, which culminated in the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. And we, <coughs> we flew support missions over the Battle of the Bulge, um, carrying uh, communi counter communications equipment that jammed at the, the German communications on the ground, especially their uh, tank communications and artillery communications. And we were, <coughs> we were sent out, there were three or four of us uh, crews that went out on that mission uh, for several days. And it was not a thing that a person would want to look forward to because when we went out we were given a pattern to fly, a very definite pattern. So many minutes on this heading and so many minutes on that, and for flying a square and oblong. Well, it didn't take long for the Germans with their radar equipment to find us. And okay. the, the anti-aircraft was a very heavy effect. It was so so heavy that we left our post and flew away. We wouldn't stay mm -hmm. there. Okay. It, it was a suicide to stay in that position. Mm -hmm. And we uh, we watched the planes ahead of us in this uh, formation. Uh, didn't seem that they could survive the flak was so heavy. Wow. And, and so our pilot said, "That's enough of this." We're not here to sacrifice ourselves. We have, we're not going. We're not here. We're not going to do any good. So let's get out of here. And we yeah. did. Yeah. And, uh, I think what they did then, and the, after that, was to change the the patterns that were being flown daily. And also, I think they could change it during the day when we were, as long as we were out there, mm -hmm. because that steady pattern, they could finally <coughs> zero in on us because they had radar equipment. They could pick us up in their anti-aircraft guns were anti were radar directed so they were could hardly miss. Okay. Well, we knew that so we got out of there. <laughs> Would they usually fly uh, uh, a few of these communications uh, and uh, uh, planes that you're on uh, would they would they fly a few of those together to in order to scramble their signals or would there be just one just your plane that would fly around? Well we, we were up together, but they might put seven or eight or ten airplanes up on the same mission, but we were we were far enough apart so we never saw each other. Okay. And once we got all over, over the east, Western Europe or the, the Scandinavian, we went up close to the Scandinavian countries to, okay. to just to divert uh, German aircraft. Mm -hmm. Waste their gasoline, and that was the main idea: was to keep them away from the bomb streams and waste fuel. We even went up and flew when there were no missions. Okay. Uh, usually, it was in terrible weather because, uh, uh, and the Germans wouldn't expect anybody to be up that day. But mm -hmm. we'd go up and turn on our equipment, and it, and it would show up on their their radar screens as a as something. They okay. couldn't tell what it was, but it was something that didn't belong there, so it had to be. Americans or British planes, mm -hmm. and they would send uh, their fighters up, and they were really short of gasoline, uh, uh, and fly around looking for us. Uh -huh. and that's what we wanted them to do. You wanted to waste their gas waste and waste their uh, gas, and, and uh, wear out their pilots and wear yeah. out their airplanes, whatever we could do to, to get them off the ground and on mm -hmm. wild goose chases. Mm -hmm. Were you escorted by any fighters when you went to do that? We, we did, but we couldn't see them. They were up higher than we were, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that was generally the case. You never saw your escort, and which kept you wondering, are they really there? <laughs> <laughs> right, for sure. Yeah. 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 Now, um, when you went over on the Queen Elizabeth, that, that would be Queen Elizabeth I, mm -hmm. uh, were you in a convoy, or were they counting no. on the speed? The, the speed, uh, the the. Queen Elizabeth, I believe, changed course every few minutes. Mm -hmm. And we were leaving New York, headed for England, but we were, got so far south that the 
the officers of the Queen Mary came out in whites and shorts. <laughs> and, and that's how much they zigzag across the Atlantic mm -hmm. to avoid. But the Queen Elizabeth was faster than any U-boat. Really? Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, they couldn't maintain a course because then they could intercept it no matter how fast it went. They could mm -hmm. have all, so that's why they zigzag. I think it was something like every well, it was every few minutes they changed course. Wow. That, so, and uh, I remember uh, uh, seeing that Queen Elizabeth and how huge it was. And I couldn't believe it when we got out in that North Atlantic to see the waves come over the bow. Mm -hmm. and that was, uh, we went up in the front of the ship with the superstructure <coughs> and watched it. Uh -huh. It just boiled right over the top of the bow, and that ship as big as it was. Mm -hmm. Was it very much seasickness? No, because it. Uh, Actually, the ship didn't roll and pitch. Mm -hmm. What do they call those things they have in them to keep them uh, uh, stabilizers well, or something? Well, there's some, there's some name for them. But anyway, I remember that uh, we you walk away along a companionway in the inside of the ship, and you look up this long companionway, and everybody's walking, <laughs> in, you know, and it would stay that way, and it was a, just a gradual mm -hmm. correction and go back the other way. Uh -huh. But it was so slow that, you know, you didn't get seasick from it unless you stared at that. I suppose that would catch you after a while. But, yeah. Yeah. Sure. but it was amazing mm -hmm. how smooth that ride was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a memorable moment, one that you could categorize as the most memorable during World War II experiences? Well, I think I think probably that, uh, well, there's, there's Depending on what what you consider a memorable one, I guess as far as uh, as actual uh, perhaps fear might be concerned would be over the Battle of the Bulge. When I already told you about that. Mm -hmm. In memorable times was every time you touched down after a mission, you got back. <laughs> uh -huh. And another one was when I landed in Florida on my birthday in 1945, back from Europe, and we came back. I volunteered to fly uh, with a, another, a bunch of volunteers, who, uh, none of whom I knew before, and we flew what they called the War where we'd be 24 back to the States. Uh -huh. And we had, it was in, uh, uh, well, it was in the winter because it was in March, and they wouldn't let us fly the North Atlantic in the wintertime to the States because you were bucking headwinds all the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had to fly to Africa. Oh. Uh, we landed in Marrakesh and went to from there to Dakar on the west coast and then across the uh, South Atlantic to Brazil and we went from Brazil up to Trinidad and then to oh. Florida. So you got that went by trip home. You got the, you got the scenic route. <laughs> yeah, uh, much better than the North Atlantic, I thought. Yes. And um, so I did land on my birthday, which, which was a nice present too. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. And then when you came back uh, to the States, uh, well, where did you go? And, and well, I came home for a, few, for a short time, then they sent us down to Atlantic City for, I guess it was what they call R&R &R now. I was there a couple of weeks, and then I was sent off to uh, San Antonio, Texas, to uh, start preliminaries for training as a B-29 flight mm -hmm. engineer. And uh, I went from there to Amarillo, Texas, and, and that's when I found out about this point system. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and that's when I got, and I went, came home in September, or I got, uh, I was sent to Fort Dix, uh, where I was discharged. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and, came, and that was on September 6th. Okay. September 5th of 45 that I was discharged from the service. Okay. Nice. And, and what did you do after that? Uh, well, I just I just got a job here in Oswego for a short time uh, down a diamond match plant, and then I went to work in a store uh, in Clyde uh, as a as a manager trainee, and, uh, and the store was sold. Eventually, I went in I went into sales, working for a company that we bought from for the store, and I worked there for. 23 years, and then I left there and went to work for another company, and I worked for them for 15 years. This is all in sales. Okay. okay. And uh, <coughs> now I'm politics. <laughs> <laughs> but that's pretty much the story. Uh, okay. Now, where did you meet your wife? 
Well, she was, I met her before the war, and she uh, was going to school out here at the college, uh -huh. and that's where I met her. But it was several years before we got married. It was, I met her before the war, and it wasn't uh, until 1950 that we got married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, so I saw her off and on all those years, but it was not, we didn't really have a serious relationship until the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, have, have you gone back uh, uh, to some reunions, you said? You with your well, we had our, we've had several reunions with our own crew, mm -hmm. but this one I went to just last month, uh, or this month, was uh, the first time the squadron has ever been over, together as, a, as an entire squadron. Okay. And this was due, due to the efforts, the son of one of the fellows that was with us and one of the original four crews that formed the squadron. Uh, and uh, he, his son did this for him. He's still there, alive, and, we, and he was there when we went down to the reunion. And uh, he did a great job of putting that all together. He did it all, mostly all at his own expense. He called me, and if he called me, he called everybody else that was there and a lot more who couldn't get there. And uh, he had a reception at his home, and then he had another uh, party in uh, uh, the following day in the community center, the place where he lives is Apex, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Now, how many people show up for, for this sort of thing? Right? Well, there were about 40, I think, of actual, right actual, they were just a crew, a flying crew members that he invited. Mm -hmm. And after 50 years, that's a pretty good to turn out when you consider mm -hmm. what can happen in 50 years to people. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and some of them, of course, lived a long way off and couldn't come. The furthest, the furthest anyone came was from Seattle, Washington. Yeah. Uh, but there were a lot of others who probably lived closer, but still couldn't make it. One of our crew members who was out near Denver couldn't come this time, but he'd been to several of our other crew reunions. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, another, there was another story that goes with my time over in England that's, that's very interesting, I think. Uh, once we got settled on the base we were going to be on, uh, the radio operator and I went into the city of Luton, which was a few miles away, and the biggest city near us. We were about 30 miles from London. <coughs> and, and we went to the Red Cross to find a place to stay overnight. And they sent us to a, a, a home of some people by the name of Belbury. And uh, she, she had turned out was born in Lynn, Massachusetts, and she was a nurse in World War I and married this Englishman and stayed there. Mm -hmm. Well, she was so happy to have us that we became more or less our whole crew. Uh, it was open house all the time we were over there. We, every yes. time we went into uh, a loot and we stay overnight, we went to Battleberries, and they never would charge us anything. Mm -hmm. And they even used to feed us as short as food was over there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and after the war, she, her husband died and she came back to the United States and brought her daughter, who was only about eight or nine years old when we were there. And, and they had in their house a big steel, in the corner of the dining room, a steel air raid shelter. And one of our air raids, they all went into that steel oh my. thing. And, and uh, I, I remember seeing it there. <coughs> and uh, her daughter's over here now and she was at the reunion this year with the... Uh, mm, nice. Um, but uh, they took, she, she had a, has a book which she had down there. It, it was just a composition book, but everybody that stayed with her, she had them sign a book from where they were from. And she had people from all over the world, Australia, New Zealanders, wow. uh, all kinds of servicemen from all branches of services, mm -hmm. uh, of the Allied services. And she, she uh, opened her house for them all. Mm -hmm. Was quite a remarkable person. Indeed. Yeah. Now, um, when you're talking about the air raid shelters that they had, uh, uh, when you were in England, did they often have air raid practices? Uh, no. They, I think those people knew what to do by the time we got there. <laughs> uh, when I was there, though, the, the buzz bombs were popular mm -hmm. coming over from there. Yeah, but they were aimed at the bigger cities like London, and as mm -hmm. much as they could aim them. They weren't very reliable about where they went. but. Mm -hmm. They would aim in the general direction of England or London, and that really not too far from Europe, European shores. So they didn't. If they deviated off a of course.
course a little bit, they still land somewhere in that area. Okay. Uh, but uh, <coughs> uh, of course those people knew what to go, where to go, and what to do. They knew that long before I got there. So, uh, and they weren't. We heard uh, uh, V bombs coming over. Mm -hmm. You could hear them. They sounded like a locomotive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sound just like a locomotive engine. Mm -hmm. It's when they stopped that you had to watch out. You mm -hmm. hoped they were far away when they stopped. That engine mm -hmm. stopped. They just fell. Okay. Okay. Ran out of fuel. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when you were um, flying, were there? Uh, could you tell there were, there were blackouts maybe uh, uh, in the cities? Yeah, they were always absolutely blacked out. There was no light anywhere. Uh, I know, even in, the, in, the, in England it was the same way. In the, we used to go in, into the city of Luton and go to dances and stuff and all mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And when you walked out of that hotel, it was pitch black. Unless yeah. there was a moon out or something, there was no light anywhere. Wow. Uh, and you had to learn to get around in the dark. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, uh, but when we were flying, we first started flying missions, we flew them with the uh, RAF at night. And, uh, and they, that's what you heard of Pathfinder aircraft, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, they went out ahead and dropped incendiaries on a target so they would and start fires. And that's uh -huh. how we'd locate the fires, with, with the targets at night. Okay. <coughs> they would go out just before dark and fly those sort of suicide missions, dropping those incendiaries mm -hmm. on a target area. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, how they could locate them. Once they, they started dropping bombs, there was no you know, fires all over. Then I remember uh, one night we were <coughs> flying a pattern out uh, just over the coast of Europe, and that night they were bombing one of the big Dutch cities, Rotterdam, or one of them, and it was unbelievable, the fires that were going on. Yeah, it lit up the whole sky. You could see airplanes in the sky from where we were flying yeah. between us and the fire. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. and, uh, and so once they uh, got found their target there, and they got bombs, fire started, so they didn't have any trouble locating their target after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, when you were in England, did they, uh, was there a lot of food rationing? That oh, you could tell? oh yeah, that was it was pretty. We used to take, in fact, we used to take food with us. We out of the mess hall it wasn't, you know, officially uh, tolerated, but we did it, you know, <laughs> and uh, to people, just uh, to give okay. them something to help them out a little bit, because, especially with the people we stayed with, mm -hmm. because we were eating their food. And we tried to supplement theirs with some of our stuff, like spam. And, oh, <laughs> okay. that was good stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, very good stuff. Yeah. Right. Did you get into London when you were stationed? I went to London once, and Mr. Battleberry took us because he knew his way around London. Mm -hmm. And we went to the Palladium Theater, and we went to uh, Tussauds Wax Museum. Uh, oh, it's that. still there. It's still there. <laughs> it's a wonderful. Have you been to it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a, I don't know what it was like when you, but it was an amazing place when I went <laughs> in there. Yeah. I remember seeing those Bobby standing on those landings, and it was just as like life. <laughs> you know, in fact, you feel like going and ask him a question or something. Yeah. Yeah. So realistic. And we saw a lot of that. I'm assuming that there was a lot of bomb damage evident when we were there. Yeah, uh, in, in some places. Uh, I didn't spend, that was the only time I went to London. I regret that I didn't go more often because it wasn't that far away. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I saw some bomb damage, but in the city of Luton where we were, there was none. Mm -hmm. and it was only 35 miles from London to yeah. as far as from here to Syracuse. Okay. And, uh, but there was no bomb damage here. Mm -hmm. They skipped that city for summer, <coughs> probably no strategic importance to it as far as industries and stuff. When you look at the photographs of the area around St. Paul's Cathedral mm -hmm. during the war, yeah. just devastating. Oh, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Same thing happened in Germany. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Members. I see. I've been to uh, to Mainz and uh, when Jimmy was over there since the war. Oh, yes. you know, mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful city, nice business area, you know, and the big square they have and all those the marketplace and all that. And I saw pictures of it after the war and it was leveled. There was nothing to stand. Mm -hmm. wow. It's amazing how they got that built, they built like that. Mm -hmm. Anything else I can tell you? But, uh, well, I think this has been very, very productive, Frank, and we certainly appreciate your participation in this project. Uh, no, 
Well, I appreciate being asked. Be part of it. Very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Can we shake hands with yeah. Well, we shake hands. There we are. Sure. Okay. Are we off the camera? We're off. We're off. We're off.